I'm Dr. Ian McCullough of Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on exponential random graph models. Our learning objectives are to understand how structural dependence in networks impacts statistical analysis of data. One of the necessary assumptions in most statistical inference is that data are independent and identically distributed. That independence assumption means that uh, the values of other data points do not impact the value of the data point you know that you're looking at and of course in networks that's not true your connections to other people is going to be completely dependent upon their connections to yet others the the attributes you have the the beliefs the values you have are going to be impacted by those that you're in social interaction with so that dependence assumption is not or independence assumption is not valid in most uh, network cases and we need to understand how to treat that uh, so we can do proper statistical analysis with networks so we want to also calculate the link the likelihood of a link in a network uh, by hand and then be able to understand how we would do hypothesis testing of various social forces you learned earlier in the course uh, using uh, empirical data from a network. Last thing we'll do is construct an exponential random graph model using the StatNet package in R. So many of you at this point are already familiar with R. I hope you are. If not, you need to make sure you download R Studio is what I would recommend. Uh, and you familiarize yourself with the CRAN, or the Comprehensive R Archive Network. These are where the packages uh, are located and where there's some description about the packages, some tutorials, etc. Why are we using R? Well, the most basic reason is it's the uh, software that has access to the statistical analysis packages, Ergum and RCNA in particular. Um, it also is very flexible in analytics in that if there's uh, something you want to do and there's not a package for it, you can write your own. And there's a large user community of people that are always doing that, and so there's, there's more uh, types of analytics available in R probably than anywhere else. And it's being increasingly used by academic and practitioner communities, so when you're looking for a job, if you can put down that you're proficient in R, that you've done social network analysis in R, statistical analysis of networks in R, uh, those are things that definitely will help you in the job market. The downside, of course, is you've got to use a command line. It's not like an easy, friendly user interface. Some people don't think that that's necessarily a downside, though. It depends on your comfortable, you know, your, your familiarity with the command line interfaces. Uh, the tutorials may not be available for particular functions you're trying to use, or they may not be that good or that comprehensive. And you can easily treat the data incorrectly if you're not careful. So in uh, social network analysis, there's two leading packages, StatNet and iGraph. They have different uh, data objects. Uh, when you coerce one from one data class into another, you can oftentimes um, mistreat the data. And, and that uh, can cause problems in how it's loaded into that data object. You may not be aware of it. So then you run like an ergum on data that's really not structured as a network and you get uh, bad results. So how you uh, treat the data is something you just need to be careful of and mindful of as you're going through this. Uh, the two key packages, StatNet and iGraph, are totally not compatible. iGraph is probably better for accessing social media data, for visualization, uh, for a variety of functions, but when it comes to the statistical analysis of networks, you really have to use StatNet or RCNA. So now we're going to talk about what the likelihood of a link is. Uh, just some, some basic uh, premises that we have going into this lecture. We understand that links in a real social network do not form at random. We uh, discussed that earlier in our lecture on subgroups. And I hopefully proved that to you, that the likelihood of two people being connected completely at random is very low. Uh, so we know that people kind of uh, form connections around social foci. And I think you've looked over the paper by Feld from 1981 that talks about social foci theory and what it is that causes people to form into communities. We also know that people have limitations on the number of connections they can maintain. So we have this from the Dunbar number, which I think we've discussed previously. And you know that if you're Google or Yahoo, you can have millions of links. If you're Kim Kardashian and uh, on Twitter, you can have millions of links because that's not a real relationship. There's nothing that's required to maintain that relationship. So when we talk about a real social network of people that are interacting, there all of a sudden becomes constraints on time, on, uh, on energy, on a lot of things that limit how many people uh, you can have. 
but we also know that people have a biological need to interact with others and so all of these things kind of interact in an interesting way to uh, form networks and we want to be able to model these in a way that allows us to do hypothesis testing and statistical inference so I'm going to give you a simple example with the smallest network I can think of, which is a three-node network. So I'd like you to pause the video here for a minute and just think about how many different configurations can you have with three nodes and undirected ties. I'm going to assume you've paused the video and maybe sketched out these, uh, these eight uh, networks that we see here. Um, there are eight configurations that you can sketch. Um, so, you know, this one here would be no links. This one, everybody's connected. and These have two and these have three, right? So, what is the likelihood of a link occurring in the network? Just one link in the network. Well, we can look at the images there and we can identify that there are three configurations that have only one link. Uh, so, the probability of observing only one link is three-eighths. Now I'd like you to pause the video and just work out for a minute, what is the probability of having zero links? What is the probability of having two links? It's a second problem. And what is the probability of having three links? I'm going to assume you've paused the video and you've answered those questions. And uh, so now we're, we'll show you the solution. Okay. So what's interesting about this is the likelihood of one or two links is much higher than the likelihood of zero or three. And we find that as the networks scale up, there will always be more configurations around the density of 0.5 than around the density of zero or one. Um, so what we're interested in, in asking is, given that there's this distribution of the likelihood of different configurations and you look at an empirical network that kind of tells you what range of values you're looking at, uh, how do we use that to control for our statistical inference? So in other words, for this problem, given that there was only one link in the network, what is the likelihood that there is a link between node i and node j? So that would be, let's say this is node i and this is node j, what is the likelihood that there is a link here? given that there is one link in the network. So I'd like you to pause the video and think about that for a minute and try and write down a solution. I'm assuming you've paused the video and written down a solution. So what we see is the link, the likelihood that there is a link from node i to node j, given that there is only one link in the network, is one third. So when we say, given that there's only one link in the network, we are eliminating these other possibilities where there is either more or less than one link in the network, and we're restricting our search, our sample space, to just the configurations with one link. And then the likelihood from i to j, there's one option where that's success, and two where that's not a success, so the answer would be one three. Well, why is that important? It's important because a lot of the variance in likelihood between uh, two nodes being connected can be explained by the density of the graph. And so this becomes something that we want to control for when we're doing statistical analysis on the network. Okay, Failing to control for the density of the network, it creates a, a significant bias in the estimation of effects. If you're saying, what's the likelihood that two people that are similar interact? Well, you have to control for the fact that like everybody can't be connected to everybody that is unrealistic for potential you know for the 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 type of network you're dealing with so we're, we're wanting to control for how much the number of edges in the network affects that uh, probability of uh, of connection okay what happens if the network is directed we were only looking at undirected and there were eight configurations what happens if we make it directed well, there are n times n minus 1 possible links, each which can be 1 or 0. So that ends up being 2 to the n times n minus 1, or 64 possible configurations you can have in your network. Okay. The number of ways to have only one link then becomes 2 times 3 choose 2, or 2 times 3, or 6 of those 64 include only one directed link. So if we want to say, what is the probability that we are observing a link between a specific node i and node j, given that there is only one directed link in the network, that likelihood is one sixth. 
So we're going to now turn this to more of a formal statistical distribution. We're going to use the Bernoulli distribution. So the Bernoulli distribution is a probability distribution uh, where a, a random variable can either be 1 or 0 with some sort of probability p of success. So we're saying the link between two actors can either be a 1 or a 0 depending on some probability if we are dealing with a random graph. So what does that distribution look like? Well, I've drawn it out here for you. So the likelihood of observing x given a parameter or probability of success p is going to be equal to this distribution here. Let's see what this looks like. If I say the likelihood of observing a 1 given probability p, well, we're going to put 1 in for x, and you'll see that p raised to the first power is just p. This term raised to the 0 power is 1, so p times 1 is p. If we look at the likelihood of getting a 0, right, then this term becomes p raised to the 0 is 1. This term is raised to the 1 power, and so you get 1 minus p. So with this distribution, you are going to get the value of 1, the presence of a link, with likelihood p, and the absence of a link with probability 1 minus p. Makes sense.